Victoria Elizabeth Flynn, who have both written some fantastic books on this subject. Um, so Laurie Flynn has um, written uh, The Girls Are All So Nice Here, which was out in hardback last year and has just come out in paperback. And Laurie Petru has written Stargazer, which will be out in the UK this Thursday. Um, so if I hand over to you both just to, you're going to be the best at describing your own books, no doubt. So um, Laurie Petru, as the birthday girl, you get to go first. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about Stargazer. Great. Thanks, Tilly. Thanks so much for having us here today, tonight. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Uh, Stargazer is, a, I, I am loathe to say it's historical fiction, but maybe it is. It's a 90s, because <laughs> I went to school in the 90s, it's a 90s campus novel. Um, I was really aiming to have an unsettling, kind of creepy, um, you know, talented Mr. Ripley style relationship between two young women. And I uh, came up with uh, Diana and Aurel, who go to school together in a made-up remote university called Rocky Barons University. And the book has to do with themes of envy and ambition and fame and wealth um, and how all those kind of things get mixed together and, and what happens in the end. Love it. Um, and Laurie Flynn, if you'd like to just um, give a little explanation about The Girls Are All So Nice Here. Um, yes, so The Girls Are Also Nice Here is also a campus novel that deals with toxic friendship between two young women. It alternates between past and present tense. In the past tense, the girls are in their first year of college, and in the present tense, they've been summoned to their 10-year reunion, which um, neither of them plan to go to, but they receive the same ominous note from someone who claims that they know what they did that one night during first semester. So somebody knows the secret and the, is going to try to expose them. So they are forced back onto campus to try to figure out who's circling them. It's, um, it really deals with a lot of themes of toxic friendship, peer pressure, and the ways in women kind of, kind of come together to either make them themselves better people as friends or kind of just be the worst possible influence on each other. And it's kind of been pitched as a darker, more disturbing mean girls. So that's kind of how my elevator pitch for it for, for people. Love it. Look, I was sold instantly on that elevator pitch. <laughs> um, so just to let you all know a little bit about tonight, um, first of all, you may all want to um, change it to speak of you so that you are just seeing um, whoever is talking at the time. So you can do that by just clicking up in the top right corner. And if you click view and select speaker, and um, that way you won't have a million different boxes on your screen. Um, so we're going to go into a bit of an interview with both Louise, and then there will be an opportunity for some questions, probably about 15 minutes or so of questions afterwards. Um, if I can ask you all to hold off on your questions until then, because I have the memory of a fish and I'm not going to remember if you ask me now in 30 minutes time what I'm asking again. So um, please just hold off for a little while. And then obviously at the end, there will be a giveaway. Um, the giveaway will be a copy of each book and that will be to whoever asks the best question. Um, and I will be deciding that. And I do accept bribes in the form of cake. I'm just throwing that out there right now. So anyway, um, now that we've kind of gone through how this is all going to work, let's kick off. Um, so as you're already on my screen, Laurie Flynn, <laughs> um, both of your books centre around complex female characters. So I'd love to know what inspired you to write about that. I think there's just so much to, to information to mine in those relationships. And I think what really compels me to write about it is that every single woman reading the book could relate to it in some way. We've all had these close friendships or relationships. Some of the friendships are long lasting ones and some of them are these short friendships with people who end up playing a role in your life but not the role you'd expect. So I feel like nobody can get under your skin like another woman or girl can, especially in your, when, in your younger years in these kind of impressionable high school and university college years, when you're trying to figure out who you are and who you want to be. And especially with college being this time of great reinvention for high school, that's really how I focused with my character, Ambrosia, the lead character in this book. She's um, really trying to reinvent herself from this kind of forgettable average girl. She 
think she was in high school and align herself with the right people to make that happen. And I think that all of us reading that can relate on some level, which is what it's so universal that I find it fascinating to write about. We all have those friendships. I had so many people message me after reading this book and say they had a Sully in their life, Sully being the bad influence friend, maybe not to the extent in this book, hopefully, but everyone sort of had these people who have shaped them. And as women, I think we really know each other's insecurities and vulnerabilities and the ways to make each other tick. And I find that just endlessly fascinating to write about in my books. Yeah, uh, definitely hope there aren't too many people with a full-blown <laughs> Sully in their lives, because <laughs> that would be scary. Um, Laurie Petru, would you kind of, were your motivations similar or was your experience any different? Yeah, definitely similar. Um, I'm very interested in that super close friendship that uh, to the exclusion of everybody else and I think that um, you know as Laurie said a lot of women can identify with that having made a friend in transformative years who becomes the very closest person and you shape each other and you influence each other and you have the same things in common but those things are developing at the same time and so you almost become mirrors of each other. Uh, I was very interested in in working on the two women together, becoming women together. Um, you know, my two characters, Diana and Aurel, become, they're, they've been next door neighbors their whole lives and, you know, Tony, Toronto, um, but are thrown together because of respective tragedies in each of their lives. And so, you know, due to trauma, they're thrown together and then just think that the other is the only person who understands them. Um, and I think many of us have been there. And then they go decide to go to university together and live at Diana's family cottage and are almost playing grown up. Um, they're living in this beautiful cottage mansion um, by the lake. They canoe back and forth to the campus and they have this like fantasy made up life that you know obviously is unsustainable, um, especially when their own interests and desires and ambitions start to divert from one another. Uh, so yeah, I, in all of my books, I'm interested in complex, complicated, disastrous relationships, whether it's siblings or whether it's parent-child or whether it's best friends. Um, and, and for this one, I wanted to have really close friends leaving high school and starting university. I'm kind of devastated that you've said the university isn't real because it just sounded like a absolute dream. <laughs> Right? I know. I wish it was. <laughs> I would have gone to the university if it was like that. <laughs> um, so obviously you both, with the uh, friendships that you've just mentioned between uh, Diana and Aurel and Ambrosia and Sully, um, most people would probably call those fairly toxic friendships. Um, what do you think it is about toxic female friendships that is just so compelling to us as readers? Uh, might as well continue with you, Laurie Petru, whilst you're there. I think it's, uh, you know, women at the start at the center of a story it's I mean there there are so many stories that involve women who are not three-dimensional who are not complicated and are not actually unlikable and those characters are so appealing to me I, it never bothers me when when people say that they they didn't really like either character and I hear it all the time but but that they loved the book and and that makes sense to me there are many books where I don't feel like I necessarily have to like the character and I don't have to endorse the relationship because People are complicated and people are, uh, you know, kind of unlikable sometimes. And I think we've had so many years and decades of women just sort of being props in books that it's lovely to have them at the center of a difficult story where they're, they're three-dimensional and they have their own motivations and their own enormous flaws. Couldn't agree more. I love, I love to hate a character. And I think one of yours, definitely at least, if not maybe both, <laughs> you've got to know <laughs> that one. <laughs> Um, so Laurie Flynn, is there um, anything anything you wanted to add about kind of why we're so obsessed with toxic female friendships? Well, first of all, I completely agree with everything Laurie just said. <laughs> it's, um, it's so true. But I think for me, it, it also comes down to just the fact that every woman reading the book will be able to see part of themselves in one of those characters. That's even if it's just a little bit or that's what I find about it. You can kind of identify yourself in these friendships because we've all had them. And I find reading about them really fascinating because it always brings me back to those formative friendships and those people who you might have known were a bad influence, but they were so appealing that you, you know, you couldn't stay away. It's just, um, it really makes a reader feel and it makes, when it's done right and it's done in all its messy, complicated glory, I really think that 
there's that feeling seen um, from a reader's point of view, which is a really powerful thing in a book. So that's, um, I think, part of our fascination with it is just that we can see ourselves in it. Definitely. Couldn't agree more. Um, and do you have, I'll carry on with you, Laurie, um, do you have any literary or even non-literary influences who made you want to write about this subject? Um, I think I've always wanted to write a novel set on campus. That was just a huge seed for this book. I just knew I wanted to set one. So I had to think of a story that would go on campus because that was just my, I, it's such an interesting um, insular type of setting that I was desperate to set a book at. And coming from YA books, I knew it had to be an adult novel this time. And um, I think I was kind of influenced by um, the Secret History by Donna Tartt. That's obviously a classic campus novel and brilliant. So those dark kind of undertones I was really inspired by and just the the way people are become so close in such a short time. And all of a sudden it's like these people are your world. So, you know, that's something that inspired me. And just the unlikable women in some of my favorite books, like um, Gone Girl, obviously, being being one of them, the classic, and um, Luckiest Girl Alive by Jessica Knoll. That's another one that, that was a, a big inspiration. Just these female protagonists who are not traditionally what you'd expect, and they're, they make bad decisions, and they're selfish, and they do things that are questionable. And I find them so fascinating to read about. So... I really wanted to, at the center of this book, have a series of complicated female characters that a reader could really either relate to or despise, but either way they would invoke some strong emotions. So I think that was sort of the starting point for this novel. I really wanted to set it on campus and I was inspired by these very complicated, morally gray women at the center of it. You absolutely nailed that. <laughs> no worries there um, and Laurie Petru any influences for you whilst writing this um, once again very similar um, I am very drawn to campus novels I am a professor um, I spend so much time on campus uh, I spent so much time on campuses as a student because I feel like I went to school for 30 years um, and and I remember being given a copy of the secret history when I was in grade 10 Latin class and fell absolutely head over heels in love with it. And I've gone through so many copies, I've dropped them in the bath, I've given them to people. Um, so that book is like, uh, just has a little cornerstone of my heart. But I also uh, am influenced by a dreamy uh, virgin suicides approach to place and kind of, a, I wanted to have a hazy, summery, dreamy, layering approach to the writing. Um, and so I would say uh, books like The Virgin Suicide that have this sort of suburban, urban summary feel to them. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely influenced the way that I approached the slow burn layering of the book um, and the, the structuring of the book. Um, so yeah, those are books that, that I go back to, uh, Sally Rooney as well, just in terms of character development. Um, I, I, at the end of the day, I, I love character books. I'm a character portrait portraitist um and and that's what's fascinating to me and I am forever being told by my editors okay let's just turn up the let's turn up the plot a little bit let's turn up the attention a little bit when I would be happy to spend all my time uh with characters because those are my favorite kinds of books so uh yeah uh totally involuntarily influenced by all the books I've loved in my life um but then returning on purpose to certain books to to help me shape the the structure and the style as well um, I'm sorry, but I have to sidebar now that you've just mentioned about being on campus all the time. Please tell me that neither of your characters are based on any students in real life. <laughs> oh God, no. People always ask me if my students influence my characters. I'm like, they keep to themselves. Like they, you know, they keep me at arm's length and, and so they should. And, and I keep them at arm's length. But uh, this was um, almost primarily, and I can talk about this later, but like I went to art school and I was a fine art student. I was a painting student. Um, so much of the, the art den and the intense hedonistic approach to being an art student in the 90s was drawn on my own experience. And so no, not my, my own student, me as a student. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's better. Um, <laughs> So, um, obviously, with Stargazer, it's based in a remote Canadian university campus, mid-90s. Um, 
what inspired you to write about that particular time and place? Obviously, you've kind of touched on it a little bit. But okay, perfect. To... So, so I can talk about it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I went to Queen's University uh, in the 90s uh, in a very small fine art program. There were only 30 of us admitted uh, each year. Uh, many of the people I went to art school with are still very successful practicing artists. Uh, it was a really interesting cohort. We were friendly with our professors. We babysat their kids. We had dinner at their houses. We we saw each other all the time. Our, our art studio was open 24 hours a day. We practically lived there at times. Um, and this is pre-cell phone. This is, you know, we kind of wandered in and out trying to find each other. So definitely influenced by that um, program and my my lifelong friends that I made in that program whose, whose appreciation of art and love of art influenced me. You know, they they were my teachers as, well, as much as my own professors were in terms of the art world. But I also... You know, I, I've grown up in Ontario and I go to cottage country, which is what we call the any lakeside, um, you know, home up in northern Ontario my whole life. Um, and I went to camp as a child and my whole family goes to something called family camp every year. And, you know, we stay in a cabin and we canoe and kayak and paddleboard and we eat in the dining hall. And so I, I wanted, you know, these things that have made me who I am. Uh, made Rocky Barrens University. And so I started to research and found this place called Torrance Barrens up north in Skoka, which is was the very first um, named protected dark sky reserve where the area, the sky is protected around the area. And so I started to build this place close to Torrance Barrens that I, that I called Rocky Barrens. And then I started to imagine what this place looked like, um, you know, in relationship to a very wealthy uh, cottage that cottage that the family you know the Martin family lived in so yeah art student mixed with growing up going to summer camp uh made this remote university <laughs> <laughs> perfect I love it um and Laurie Flynn obviously yours is set at the uh, very prestigious Wesleyan um is there any reason that you chose to set your novel there no like it's so I, I get asked that and it's I wish I had a cooler story for it I think what I really wanted was that like New England liberal arts vibe campus like, and a bit of a smaller campus where rumors would travel easily and people would kind of know people. And um, I kind of really wanted that vibe. So I was doing some Googling and I decided I wanted to set it at, at Wesleyan. So um, the challenge from there came from really researching every single detail of this school because I've never been there. So I had to make sure I really nailed it because readers reading it or who might have gone there or known somebody gone or who went there are going to be extremely critical since it's a real setting and it takes place in two timelines so I had to get the past details right and then I had to get the present details right of things that might have changed on campus and luckily I had some wonderful people who have gone there um, help me out with the details and they were lifesavers I swear I emailed my one friend, Nicole, I emailed her, I, I think a hundred times just about, okay, so this and this and this. And um, she was so gracious with um, with giving information, but it was really, it was a fun challenge. And I think the greatest reward is when readers or people who've gone there or alumni or people say that I really nailed the vibe of the campus. And I'm really proud of that because, you know, <laughs> setting is tough to, to get right. Sometimes you really, and when it's done right, I think it becomes its own character in the story. So um, I really wanted that vibe of these liberal arts, kind of artsy kids coming together and being on this campus that is kind of tight knit where you might know what other people are up to. And if something bad happens, those rumors are really gonna travel um, throughout all the friend groups. So um, that has a, plays a role in the book too. It's definitely an other character in there for sure. Have you been to visit now or still? No, because of COVID, I never, I haven't been, but one day I'm going to go and it'll be really cool, I think, to be able to see in person the places yeah. I wrote it. Yeah, and how it matches up to your kind of idea and description of it. But for the next book, would you still go for a real location or do you think you might kind of do like Laurie and create somewhere so you can have a bit more free reign? <laughs> I'm not sure. Lori did such a great job with that campus. I literally wanted to live there and I found it, it was one of those things where I was like, oh wow, it's so cool. Does it exist? Like it's like she wrote about it so vividly. So, and I really want it to exist. But um, I think for my next, my next book is um, 
so far real places. So that, um, I don't know. I don't know why I do this myself. <laughs> a lot of research, but, um, you know, we'll see. <laughs> I guess that leads into um, another question which I have for you, which is, how much research do you do uh, when writing a novel? And do you enjoy that part of the process? Or is it kind of like a tick the box, just got to get it done? Um, here's the way I write. I write a first draft before I do basically any research because I have to get them like bare bones structure. Like I need to get that out of the way. And um, if I research as I go, I make the slowest progress ever. I lose my momentum. So I can't do it that way. Basically, I write a first draft and then I go in and make it good because <laughs> the first draft is usually pretty messy. So um, with the girls are also nice here. I wrote this first draft. It was way too long. It was unwieldy. It was, it had all sorts of plot threads that meandered. But um, once I kind of had that out of the way and at least my, you know, basic plot down on paper and the characters and even though they still needed a lot of development, um, I was able to research from there. So I always print out a um, hard copy of the manuscript and mark it up. And so that's what I did. And usually I'll identify all the places in the book where something has to be researched or a setting has to be fleshed out. And it's a ton of work, but um, usually at that second draft stage is when I do my research. And I kind of, I do enjoy it, but I also have to kind of balance it with keeping the momentum going of the actual writing. So I find that I can easily disappear into a rabbit hole of looking up something for like one sentence or something that's gonna be in a paragraph that a reader might not even care about, but it's like, oh, it has to be right. So um, I guess I, I find it as a, as a person who gets easily distracted, I, I can definitely fall into these rabbit holes where all of a sudden I'm on Instagram again and it's like okay well I don't know I was started out researching this and I've lost my train of thought so um, I do enjoy it but um, again it's just a matter of I kind of have to do it as I revise otherwise I will lose entire days and lose my plot in the meantime. <laughs> that makes sense I get that um, and Laurie Petru how about you did you have to do a lot of research and how um, do you feel about it or are you sick of it because you work in an academic setting already? <laughs> Uh, I can be incredibly lazy. And so I, I, I mean, that's why I love historical novels because they're so thoroughly researched and so well done. And I just think, oh, I like I research when I want to like kind of reassure myself that I could, that this is what I want it to be. And then, you know, I, like me, having said that, sometimes I'll find a topic and just like Laurie was saying, and I just become almost obsessive about it. Um, the book that I just finished uh, writing with the main character is a taxidermist and I have become an incredible bore about taxidermy like I will start talking about it at parties and people will be staring at me with these blank looks on their faces. I talk about this incredible world of taxidermists and how they're these incredible artists and sculptors and this documentary they have to watch and I have uh, you know a taxidermist on speed dial on my phone and and so I, but so little of that research will turn up in the book and so similarly I, I will find myself going down these very deep rabbit holes that you know I will just have to take little bits of, um, you know, of color from to influence my my books. Um, so for Stargazer, yeah, it was like mining my own experience. I, I and then doing some research into place, but I am very fearful of making uh, books take place in real places and time because even my my first book, Sister of Mine, you know, it takes place in a small town that is not dissimilar to the very small town I live in. And you know, I ended up at a book club with some old biddies who said, you know. That's not actually the way that, there wouldn't have been babysitting or daycare during that period of time. And I, I had this vision of people picking, picking apart anything that I put in my books that was real. So uh, I deeply admire people who do incredible research into real places where I sort of make things up as I go along and research as I see fit and, you know, cobble it all together with glue and scotch tape. <laughs> <laughs> well, it works because I had to check with you whether that was a real campus because I was so sure that it was there. Um, so one of the other um, kind of themes that you both explore very well is that of um, kind of wealth and privilege. Um, so kind of a lot of your characters come from a certain uh, background. They have a lot of family money. Um, so how important do you think that was to the story? Um, to influencing your character's behavior and their kind of storyline. Um, Laurie, Patricia, if you wanna carry on. 
Uh, yeah, so for me, it was very important. I didn't want the tragedy or uh, any of the sadness or trauma that happened to the girls to be as a result of, of class. I wanted them to be in this position of privilege that made them second guess everything that they experienced, you know, and they do kind of, you know, they're kind of self-aware, uh, but only in the way that people who would never really have to be, to worry about it can be self-aware. You know, they, they don't think about it a lot. They, they're they aware of it because, because they're young women of a certain place and time. But, um, you know, the things that happen to these girls and they have this wonderful life and everything seems like it's there for the taking and then they take and take and take and take and take. And I, I wanted them to be going to a university that people wouldn't be able to, everyone wouldn't be able to have that experience. Um, it, wealth and privilege was very important to me. Uh, first of all, I mean, I knew that Aurel's mother was going to be a famous fashion designer. And for them to be neighbors, you know, Diana wouldn't be living next door to her unless she, her family's also wealthy. Now her family's old money and, you know, um, Aurel's family's new money. And so those tiny little particulars and nuances of privilege had to work their way in as well. But yeah, it's, it's definitely a theme in the book and it was important to me to keep it that way. And do you think, sorry, just sidebar again, do you think that readers also kind of take a bit more satisfaction in watching someone from that kind of background and their downfall almost. I, I've noticed that. Like I, I wasn't sure how people were going to respond to the privilege of the book, um, but I think I, I managed to make, hang a lantern on it as my friend says. Like I wasn't trying to hide from it. I was, it was, it's right out there in the book. I'm, I'm not hiding from the fact that this is a book about two very wealthy young women. Um, and I think the fact that I'm not hiding it from it uh, makes people aware of it and you can examine it and you can pick it apart in a way, in a good way. Um, whereas if I, I didn't really mention it, then it would appear that I, I wasn't aware of it either. So uh, yeah, readers seem to find some satisfaction in that, but also it, it makes them, it seems, reflect upon uh, the wealth and privilege of the girls themselves. And Laurie Flynn, was that um, this yeah. decision? Yeah, for my book, um, Ambrosia, she comes from just like a middle-class family, whereas a lot of the girls at Wesleyan, including Sully, come from money. So it's just another thing dividing her from these girls who she really desperately wants to emulate because she just sees them as effortlessly cool. And this whole concept of effortlessness and not having to try really is what she wants after she kind of enters this world. because She feels like she's always trying so hard to get a foothold, to keep up, to be noticed at all. And um, especially like she came from middle class in her high school. She was kind of, you know, average, not particularly one of the popular people. So she really wanted this fresh experience. But when she gets to Wesleyan, she realizes it's a whole new playing field. And these with these girls who just have these designer clothes and are just effortless in different ways that she's not. So I think the financial element of it, of her background versus their background and her seeing it as something she wants to conceal so that they accept her as one of their own is just another point of insecurity for her, of which she has many, and um, another kind of driving force behind why she is the way she is. Yeah. Um, so we were talking a little bit about the settings as being almost a character within themselves. Um, why do you think as readers we're so intrigued and fascinated by the secretive worlds of the elite and celebrities? So I'll go with you, Laurie Flynn, as well. <laughs> yeah, I think especially it's just there's so much like juicy, gossipy kind of vibes and it's just irresistible I find I just absolutely can't get enough of reading about stuff like that and I think the campus setting in particular is so intriguing because it's your first time away from home for most people it's kind of insular it's walled in almost in the sense that your orbit basically exists around this campus if you generally stay on campus your friends are all there they're living in the same dorms you see them all the time they become your life and I just, I think that's fascinating for people because A, we've all kind of had an experience like that, most likely, you know, if, if you've gone to college or university, it's um, something that people can relate to, that feeling of it's exciting because it's a fresh start and a new way to invent yourself. It's also terrifying because what if you don't get in with the right people and you don't kind of 
undergo that reinvention that you so desperately wanted and what happens if it goes horribly wrong which is what happens in this book but I think um these places where it's almost like it's so difficult to try to find your footing because you're you feel like a fish out of water I think that's an emotion that a lot of people can relate to and these books that kind of center around maybe a campus where people are very wealthy or a celebrity kind of vibe where there's it's kind of unattainable. And I think we can all relate to wanting something and then just not, and falling short because we we don't think we're good enough or we don't fit in. So I think um, there's a quality that the readers can kind of see themselves in. And there's also kind of a train wreck quality to it because you just know these people in the book are so desperate to, to fit into this new world that what are they gonna do to get there? And that's uh, um, something that factored heavily in my book. Mm -hmm. And we won't give any spoilers away, but you, you do need to read and see where they get to, guys. <laughs> um, so, Laurie, for true, any views um, about why we are so fascinated by the elite? We, we like to see people fall who seem like they're so high up. Um, and it it's glimmering and it's glittery and it looks so beautiful and wonderful and how, you know, how delicious to see that it's not or to see that crack somehow. Um, I think, you know, both Ambrosia in Laurie's book and Aurel in my book try to reinvent themselves in university. Um, Ambrosia wants to become something different and completely get rid of her past and reinvent herself that way. And Aurel the same way, but she almost wants to disappear into the campus. Um, and, you know, Diana and Aurel both have lots of money, but Diana wants the fame and she wants, you know, the money isn't enough. And for her, success is not wealth, it's notoriety. Whereas for Aurel, the notoriety is the worst thing for her. Um, it's plagued her her whole life. And uh, so she knows celebrity and she knows what it's like to be in the public eye. And Diana wants that more than anything. And to watch that kind of um, blind ambition and um, you know, unabashed um, envy is something that I think that we find really delicious. Absolutely. Um... I, yeah, Diana's ambition was just off the charts. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I could not relate that much, but I <laughs> love it. Um, so obviously the theme tonight is girls who get what they want. And without giving too much away, um, how would you say that your characters, so I guess specifically probably it is more Diana who really has kind of that goal in mind. How would you say that she goes about getting what she wants or trying to? Diana is a gifted artist, but she also puts in the work. Like, uh, you know, she she's in art school and she, there are other artists there and they're all sort of on the level playing field when they're there, but she puts in the extra work. She puts in the extra hours. She's got this, you know, wild talent, but it's kind of wild when she gets there and she figures out a way to harness it to something and to give it, um, give it shape and give it um, an objective, you know, and that, that reminded me of being at school and feeling, you know, a lot of people there were talented, but it wasn't until we really were able to focus on what we wanted, what message we wanted to give and what we wanted to put out into the world with our work that, that the, that the art really started to show promise. And Diana figures that out. So that's how she gets what she wants. She sees in, in ORL an opportunity to, to make her art more than just skill, but to, to make it something that, people want to see and people are interested in. Um, it's not enough for her to be uh, technically strong. And Grace, the fine art teacher who's there, points that out to her, you know, and she drives her and, and, and encourages her to break some rules and to push her, her technical skill into something more interesting, into some kind of commentary. And, you know, her, her very closest, intimate, best friend is that opportunity. Um, it's right there in front of her. And so I think how she gets what she wants is is the work and the ambition and also maybe that ethical gray area, you know, she will justify to herself any of the means to get what she wants. And it's not like, there's some, you can feel some pity for Diana. You know, she's, there are moments where you see her vulnerability and you realize that she's actually as an exacting a person as she is, as strong as she is, as absolutely determined and also you know she'll never let you know that she has any doubts there's a vulnerability and a sadness there and that she's experienced some pain um and it's just below the surface uh so she keeps this very strong facade and veneer um in order to keep on 
getting what she wants right until the very end. Yeah, that's true. She's a very kind of multi-dimensional character. She's not just easy to hate and that's that. There is a bit more to her, isn't there? <laughs> I um, like <laughs> okay well we'll let the other readers decide i'd be curious to know anyone who's read it later on let me know what you think <laughs> um, and laurie flynn um yeah i think ambrosia just goes about things all the wrong way she's very <laughs> determined when she starts at, at school she really wants to um, work on her craft which is she wants to become an actress she's in for the theater program and you know she, people back home kind of chided her almost or you know didn't think it was something she was going to do she's never going to make it as an actress so she's kind of really has this confident mindset she wants to prove them wrong but she gets to campus and literally her first day there she feels insecure and unworthy already just because of how much cooler she perceives all the other girls to be and she thinks wow like this is what I'm up against I'm never going to amount to anything so she kind of loses her um, ambition for theater at the same time as she renews this new ambition to get Sully to notice her and kind of, she sees Sully as like the leader of this um, pack of girls and somebody who has a lot of influence and sway and she wants to be like that she wants to be looked up to like that and she wants her opinions to be heard and her she wanted she wants to be as seen as she perceives that Sully is and she goes about it all the wrong way. She, her roommate is um, a girl named Flora, who is very sweet and very kind. And um, she kind of, Ambrosia ends up kind of aligning with Sully and thinking, well, that's not how a girl should act. Like, you know, the world, we don't owe the world anything. So, and getting, being nice gets you nowhere. So let's just be cruel and care only about ourselves. And Ambrosia just kind of ends up in this um, like relentless kind of, climb up this ladder to try to get Sally's approval and every time she thinks she has a foothold it just the stakes get even higher and higher and higher so she I think loses sight of what she wants very early on and ends up having these new goal posts which are nothing to do with what she went to school for it's um all these social dynamics that she gets entangled in and she thinks that like it gives her this gratification to get Sally's attention but Sully's really just batting her around like a toy because she can. So it's um, kind of a bit of a train wreck waiting to happen with um, with what's going to happen and how far she'll go to get her Sully's admiration and approval. Yeah, train wreck is a very good way of describing it. So I think we've probably only got time for about one more question before we open it up to um, viewers. So I would love to know, have you thought about it if it was adapted to film? Um, so I'll start with you, Laurie, who would be your um, Ambrosia and Sully? Oh my gosh, that's such a hard question. Um, <laughs> I forgot it, about it, this question. Oh, oh sorry, <laughs> should I have picked anything but this question? <laughs> It's really? so like I'm fascinated too by um what would happen. Um, mm. you know, there's so many amazing actresses. I will say that um Sully has these iconic eyebrows and the um Cara Delavine's eyebrows kind of inspired her. So I'm like, oh, that would be a cool match. And um I love Emma Roberts for Ambrosia. I just think she's so versatile. I just love her. But there's literally so many actresses that I would just be thrilled to see in the roles and I'd be so fascinated to see what kind of who would be cast and it has been optioned for a tv series um by at AMC so fingers crossed that um something happens I don't know <laughs> amazing oh okay well we'll get to see if it plays out Please. Emma Roberts throw out the vibes Cara Delevingne <laughs> <laughs> the vibes out there um so Laurie Petru sorry sorry God. I'm gonna choose somebody who's like 60 years old like I <laughs> I feel like, <laughs> I really don't feel like I'd be trusted to choose anyone, and I have such a vivid picture in my mind of what uh, what the girls look like. I honestly, I feel like I couldn't do this justice, but I do love it when I see that people throw out. You know, sometimes on Instagram, people will make like a a cast of who they can imagine, and uh, that. I love, um, but I, I honestly, I can't do it any kind of there's no, there's no one that I can see um, who is even that age. <laughs> yes, that's the problem. I don't really know anyone below the age of eight, like 30 anymore. And obviously Diana's quite like 
big, like very tall, isn't she? And athletic. And I'm trying to think of anybody. Probably have to go for an Olympic athlete or something, I guess. <laughs> mm-hmm. But well, we'll leave you thinking about that. If you come up with anybody, then, you know, throw it out on Twitter or Instagram or something, because I'm sure we'd all like to know. Um, so thank you very much for that lovely discussion. That was obviously really fascinating to hear kind of the thought process behind um, these books. But I guess now we will open it up. I'm going to make sure that I can see the chat. Um, and if you would like to send any questions for either of the lorries, now is your time. Um, and remember, the best one will win a copy of both of the books. So thinking caps on, people. Um, whilst I, I'll give them a minute just to kind of type, because if anybody's like me and on an iPad or something, then it will take them probably like a minute to type anything. Um, so in the meantime, let's squeeze in one more question whilst people are writing um, their questions in. What do you hope that readers will take away from your novel? Uh, Laurie P, as your... <laughs> I really, I mean, I, I, I think someone said uh, that it's, you know, like a, it's like a Lana Del Rey record or, you know, uh, it's like Sally Rooney, but twisty and dark. You know, these are people have mentioned virgin suicides, like something about this kind of hazy, dreamy idea that's just unsettling. Like there's, you know, I'm not a, a crime writer per se. I, I'm interested in that unsettling, disturbing feeling. And I want I want people, the book, the characters to stay with people. Um, you know, there's nothing better than people saying, I'll be thinking about these characters for a long time. That's the best thing for a writer to, to hear. Uh, even if they finish the book in a couple of days, uh, what better than, than to know that something has bothered them and gotten under their skin. So that's, regardless of all of the themes and all of the, the storylines and characters themselves, I would love it if, if it sticks. Okay, mission accomplished, because I don't think I'm going to get either of those girls anytime soon. <laughs> um, and Laurie Flynn, what would you like readers to take away? Oh, I guess just the enormous amount of pressure on girls and young women and the things that these, you know, perceived notions of how they should be acting really mess with them and and how that societal expectation just kind of invades everyone's head in a different way and makes them act out in completely different directions and just how the influence of one person can impact so many lives in this case if Am wouldn't have become friends with Sully then or if she would have gravitated towards somebody else what how would things have been different they would have been different for so many people and so many lives would have been um, just completely different and some people would be alive as a result. It's just so like it's fascinating for me to think about how just these all these things are so interconnected. So I kind of hope a reader would just kind of take that away and just the impact of judgment and the Im how much words can the influence that words can have on somebody. And um, I think that can kind of you know be the last thing people take away. That's a brilliant message to take away, I think. Um, so we have now got lots of questions coming in. So here They're we go. They're amazing. These are really, oh, really I was going to say, these guys should have um, should have done my bit, shouldn't they? <laughs> so um, well, I want to keep all these questions. Know. Like, I, I probably have to like think about the answers for a long time. Right. I was going to say, you two might have to answer this one together. So um, Leslie would like to know, if Diana, Aurel, Ambrosia and Sully came together, what crime would they like to commit? And would they be found guilty of it or would they get away with it? Uh, so I guess Laurie P, I don't know, I work together, ladies. <laughs> I mean, I think Sully and Diana would, I mean, it would be like they would spontaneously combust. Like, I don't think those two women could they couldn't be friends like they couldn't I don't even think they could be accomplices so maybe you know maybe Ambrosia and Aurel would like get rid of them and go off to the sunset together I, I, I don't know but oh. I don't think those two super type a you know leaders could exist in the same no they would be plotting each other's murders yeah and, uh, that the other I don't know that would just be a total disaster yeah yeah, yeah. it's so neat to imagine them like at the school at a school at the same time and knowing that you know because that happens you have these women and these characters in real life who are floating around in the same place together and maybe mm -hmm. never encounter each other and it's kind of neat to imagine them at the same school and at the same time but never cross paths. 
crossover yes. novel. <laughs> um, so the next question is from Sylvia, uh, who says that it's um, been great listening to you both. So she was wondering whether there is something that didn't make it into the final version of the book, but that you'd like to share with us. Uh, so Laurie Petru. I'm going to let Lori, other Lori, feel this one first. Okay. Something. Um, I, I will say that the first draft of this book was 130,000 words. It was a beast. And um, a lot of things did not make it into the final book. And um, I, I, there's something, but I can't say it because it's too spoilery. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else that um, didn't make it in. Um, I don't know, I have a whole Word document of like um, passages I loved, but that never made it in. I just like, I'm gonna slot them over here just so that I can remember what they were. But um, I think just some of the relationships changed from um, that first draft to the final product. And that's probably the, the bulk of it is just the relationships really got deepened between the characters and um, especially, um, Kevin's character he's um Flora the roommate her boyfriend he um he was really fleshed out in revision so he was a lot more of a even more of like a typical just frat boy um and I really had to work on on him and revisions to make him somebody that a girl would would be drawn to and, and fall in love with so um I think his character underwent a bit of a metamorphosis um and I don't I can't think of any particular scenes that didn't make it in without giving stuff away. <laughs> no, we don't want any spoilers. I don't no, know how much people are so spoilery. Saying people are off to buy the book, so let's not give anything away. Um, so, Laurie Petrie, you've had a bit of time now. <laughs> Can I you mean, I have, I have the opposite problem with Laurie. Like, I, I, I never read enough, and I always have to like add more. Add like I, you know, my books, my first drafts are always so short. Um, but I would say that the ending was sort of up for grabs for a long time. Um, and, you know, it could have gone, it, it could have gone in a different, a different way. Um, okay. So I'll just hit that. Yeah. <laughs> um, righty, let's have a look. So Sarah would like to know if there was ever a point where one of your characters rebelled from what you had planned for them or change the trajectory of your plot. So do your characters actually kind of drive the story at all in any way? Um, Laurie Petrie, you're on my screen right now, so. <laughs> sure, uh, yeah, I, I would say, um, I would say that Diana, she's, she's kind of a force to be reckoned with and, um, and, and would propel things forward in a way that maybe isn't, doesn't come naturally to me. Um, you know, I, I think that, every time I thought I could push her further she could go further than that so um yeah she's 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 a tough nut um okay. <laughs> and I would say that she would rebel and push further maybe not in a different direction but farther worse mm -hmm. so you mean you're not completely ruthless <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> okay and um Laurie Flynn um yeah that's a, I love this question so much um I'm I don't plot my books or I didn't um, until recently. I'm trying to be more organized now because I have four kids, five and under. So they, they keep me busy. So, <laughs> but when I wrote this book, I didn't plot any of it. So everything was an experience for me. And um, Ambrosia is the main character. She just took me everywhere. She took me through the whole book. I didn't even know what I was doing to start, what I was writing about to start. I just knew it was going to be a campus novel with um, these two women and um, who become have this very destructive toxic friendship so um I would say that Ambrosia dictated the whole book and some of the directions that she took really did surprise me um and I was kind of like okay I guess we're going here now all right um and I think everything I find like when you don't plot a book it's so fascinating the journey that the character will take you on because it might be completely different than what you expected or where you thought you were going and I think um some of the things that the girls did in this book were so cruel, but I kind of leaned into it because it felt right for the character. And I kind of think when you're writing, that's always a, a question I'm asking myself with, um, as a writer of, of suspense novels, it's um, because I never want things to just happen for shock value. It has to, I think twists and turns really have to be authentic for the character. And 
that's what I was asking myself at every turn as I got to know this character better and better. And the book went to some very dark places, but I think it felt like a, authentic to me. And that was sort of, I kind of just let her take me along for the ride and um, take me into this world and let myself kind of put myself in her shoes and what she might be feeling. And um, that's, um, this is what I came up with. <laughs> Uh, I love that. I love the idea of these characters kind of like running away with you and just becoming their whole own <laughs> thing out there. Maybe they're still going on somewhere, you know, <laughs> whole other story to be told. Um, so the next question is from Karen and she'd like to know whether writing these stories sparked off any new character ideas for you for any future projects. So did you both say that you're currently writing another one or um, Laurie Flynn, I guess, start with you as you're there. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm working on another one right now. So I think as I'm writing, I, it's everything, whenever I'm working on a book, I always come up with ideas for new books. It's like a really bad problem to have because I'd be excited about what I'm working on, but then in the back of my head, I'm like, Ooh, I think it's because I'm being creative and getting in that routine. And that just sparks more creativity for me. If I'm like in a good place with them, writing a lot and reading a lot my brain is overflowing with ideas. So I end up with like notes app in my phone that I have like all sorts of ideas and maybe I'm, I'll be working on a book and something will come to me and I'll kind of write it down and put it aside for later. That's kind of what I do. And I remember writing the girls are also nice here and kind of coming up with some future ideas like, okay, this isn't going to fit in this book, but I write every single thing down because otherwise I will forget instantly. So um, I have a, a Word doc in my computer and Notes app is full of different things. So I think my brain's always churning out ideas and especially ones that like, I, won't, I know I don't have time to work on right now and it's frustrating, but it's also just part of the fun of being an author, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lots of shiny new things to distract you whilst you're working on everything. <laughs> um, Laurie, do you struggle with that? Patrice, do you struggle with that as well? Kind of well, suddenly you want to go off and explore this other idea. Well, I think that's something that people, I mean, Laurie and I wrote these books a long time ago. And I think that you know, people don't maybe always realize that, you know, the books that they're reading were finished a long time ago. And so, um, and, and that a lot of writing is waiting. And so you might write a draft and then your agent or editor is reading the draft. And during those periods of waiting, you you know, I started the project and it might be in the very, very early stages and it might end up being an outline that goes nowhere. But, um, you know, I, I write every day. And so when there's periods of time where I can't work on the book that is done or is drafted and I'm waiting for note on notes for, then yeah, I'm always working on something else. And so, um, and, and I think a lot of writers are the same way, right? We have a lot of stuff that either are, you know, out on, you know, I have a book out on sub right now. I have a book that's finished draft. I have a book that's coming out in three days. And, you know, they're always at different stages of development because we're always writing. Um, and so whether the question was whether these stories sparked off new character ideas, I would say that the style of writing, and I think what Laurie said was true for me too, like there are periods where I was writing and I felt really good about it. And uh, my brain was kind of primed for creativity. And um, even if I was rereading some of those bits, I would feel like, oh yeah, that's a good, that's a good part. Like now I, now I feel like working on this other thing that I'm working on. Um, it's almost like getting in, getting the muscles warmed up and then going in and taking a sprint. Um, so yeah, uh, always writing always, and kind of influenced by things that were working well. Like I wouldn't read a passage before bed that was crap and that was making me feel kind of, it was difficult, but I might read something that's going well. And then I might stay up for an extra hour and work on something else. Okay, so there's never any relaxing time. <laughs> well, it is relaxing to me. Like, I love it. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Oh, dream job in that case. Um, so we've got one last question, um, which is from Lucy, who says that they are very interesting characters. Yes. Um, you, you're both talking about women getting their own way. What's the most significant example of you getting your own way? And was it worth it? So here comes the juicy stuff. Um, so Laurie for true, whilst you're there. Not super juicy, like I'm. Really yeah, like, go on. Still no, it's, it's really not. Like I'm such a nerd, but um, I mean, I I work in academia, and uh, you know that I I write fiction, and 
I don't do other kind of scholarly work. And I really bucked against that. Like I finished my PhD and I never wanted to continue in that vein. And I've been so fortunate to work at a university that's so supportive of my creative work, but um, I just kind of kept on keeping on. And it, it's really important to me that, um, that my, that my novels and that my creative work and that my, my ambitions uh, for, for writing are, are prized by, an institution that doesn't normally prize that kind of thing. And when I was first hired, I was only 27. And I just so was so bullish about the fact that I felt like this was okay. And there should be a place for, for, for fiction in academia and just kind of kept on like hands on hips. And I'm just going to keep on doing this. And, um, and so that's what I wanted. And that's what I got. And I, and I feel like now I'm in a place where I'm, I'm protected and so fortunate. And I love my job so much. And now I'm teaching writing courses and I have young mentors who are writers. And I, I feel like what a dream. Um, but maybe that was a bit of a risky move at the time. So again, that is a super nerdy, very safe, not super juicy answer to, <laughs> but my other one was the time I got a golden retriever. So these are not, like, I am not a rebellious person. <laughs> we want the golden retriever story. <laughs> um, well, I for one am very glad that you were allowed to go and do your fiction thing, because I think anybody who's read Stargazer will be very grateful. Um, so Laurie Flynn, any juicy examples of getting your own way? I think honestly, this is another writerly answer, but I think okay. choosing to pursue writing as a career is in itself um, an act of um, you really have to want it and you really have to go after it. And it's, it's almost its own rebellion because people kind of want ex or expect you to go into, you know, what you went to school for, or they expect that you're going to have a certain job that's a certain way. And writing is just and like admitting that you want to make a living from writing books is a, is a, you know, a big statement to make. And um, a lot of people just wait for you to fail because they expect that you're going to, because it's, it seems too frivolous. So I think for me, I, I knew what I wanted and um, it wasn't what I went to school for. I went to school for journalism. So deciding that I did not want to do that for, with my life and um, kind of just following where, where my dreams took me, I've kind of, had a unconventional path. I did some modeling for a while. I stopped school to do that. And that was just, I've kind of just done what I wanted with my life, which I think is pretty cool um, to be able to say. And um, writing fiction is something I always wanted from a young age, but I kind of lost that for a little while because I did listen to society and people saying, oh, it's going to be too hard. Oh, you're not going to make a living off that. You're never going to be able to do that. And um, kind of making my own path and um, d admitting that this is what I want and this is what I'm going to go for and I'm not going to stop and, you know, putting in the work to get an agent and, um, you know, research agents and get your book in shape and learn about the industry and all these things, um, they're, they're big dreams and they're big, a lot of work that's required. So I kind of think, you know, in terms of getting what I want, I knew what I wanted and I went after it and I'm, continuing to make it happen and be able to have this as my dream job. So that's, um, that's not, again, not like a juicy scandalous answer, but that's some, probably the thing that I'm the most proud of. Oh, and it's an inspiring answer, definitely. And I think we're all very glad that you stuck to it and ignored whatever anybody else's opinions are about a stable career or <laughs> whatever else. We're very <laughs> grateful. Um, so now I need to try and choose a winner um, so first of all, let me just say that um, whoever I am about to choose as a winner, Holly from Verve Books is going to pop her address, her email address into the chat box. And if you could please send her your address details so she can get the books posted out to you. So I think, sorry, but I really can't get past um, Leslie's question and trying to imagine all of the characters committing a crime together to be honest so I think that's gonna Leslie you are my giveaway winner and um, everybody else though amazing questions thank you so much um I really enjoyed hearing the responses to those that um it was yeah absolutely brilliant I'm sorry that there are some which I have had to miss um because I think we're kind of time's up right now um but obviously both authors are on I think you're both on Twitter and Instagram are you kind of happy if people really have burning questions? Are you happy for people to get in touch with you and kind of talk about the books and stuff? Yes, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. 
put you on the spot or anything. But <laughs> um, all right. Well, <laughs> thank you again, everybody, for coming. Um, thank you especially to Beth Lorries for taking some time out of your day and discussing these brilliant, brilliant books. Um, I have no doubt that anybody, like anyone who's listening and hasn't read them yet, please go off and order them. I can't imagine that tonight's conversation hasn't made you want to. You won't regret it. Um, Laurie's Yours is out on Thursday in the UK, so you can pre-order, even better. Um, and Laurie Elizabeth, the, um, the Girls Are All So Nice Here is already out in paperback, so you can just go pick up a copy and get stuck in. Um, apologies for the sleepless nights that you'll probably get because they're kind of one of those that you're not going to want to put down both of them so um, yeah happy reading and I will let you both go because obviously Laurie Petrie you need to go and celebrate your birthday um, <laughs> yeah like have a fantastic rest of the day both of you thank you and so much else, I hope you have a great evening and thank you again for joining us thank you so Bye. much it's been so much fun <laughs> it has it's been great thank you all right, take care, everybody.